This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the Greek interpreter interpreted, the Norwood builder built, and the Regate squires puzzled, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. How many disguises did Sherlock Holmes use? What were the street Arabs? And how did he get information from his underground network? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 189. My old friend Charlie Peace. Well, hello and welcome once again to Trifles, a Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I am Scott Monty. I am Bert Wolder. And Bert, I'm ready to make peace with our with our production process here. We've people don't know this behind the scenes. We have had a lot of struggles this morning from a technological perspective. And uh, I, I was getting ready to, to, to throttle my system. Um, we've settled it. We've made peace with it. And now we're going to talk about Charlie Peace. But before we do that, I want to ri- remind folks that this episode can be found at iHose.co slash trifles189, all lowercase. Uh, that will bring you to the show notes for this episode. Uh, we'll have links of uh, uh, related to what we're talking about here and the ability to support the show via PayPal or Patreon. If you are a patron, uh, you will receive the show earlier than anyone else. And we also have a number of prizes that we or thank you gifts that we give away at various levels of contribution. Uh, we charge you on a monthly basis and we do appreciate you helping us to keep the doors open here. So thank you in advance for thinking of that. Now, on with the show. My old friend, Charlie Peace. You know, there are only two Charlies mentioned in the Sherlock Holmes canon. Uh, the, first, <laughs> the first is Charlie Williams, who was mentioned in... Do you know which uh, story he was mentioned in, Bert? No, I don't remember. Uh, I don't blame you, because it's a throwaway reference, and it is uh, completely arcane. It's from the Valley of Fear. Uh, he's, it was... Um, McMurdo, he said, that's true enough. We'll talk about the cows. Well, we'll talk till the cows come home of the killing of Charlie Williams or of Simon Bird or of any other job in the past. But until the work is done, we say nothing. So that's that's one Charlie. But we get to another Charlie who is also a throwaway reference, but he's more interesting because this is a historical figure. It is in The Illustrious Client where Watson and Holmes are talking about, I guess it's Baron Gruner. Watson says, um, no, I don't know. This isn't Watson. Sorry. This is uh, Sir James Damery, who, who um, says he has expensive tastes. He's a horse fancier. For a short time, he played polo at Hurlingham. But then this Prague affair got noised about, and he had to leave. He collects books and pictures. He's a man with considerable artistic side to his nature. He is, I believe, a recognized authority upon Chinese pottery and has written a book upon the subject. A complex mind, said Holmes. All great criminals have that. My old friend Charlie Peace was a violin virtuoso. Wainwright was also no mean artist. I could quote many more. (laughs) So, my old friend Charlie Peace. Now, here's the thing. We need to clarify. This was not actually Holmes's friend. At least not that we're aware of. But but let's explore for a bit a little about Charlie Peace and why he would have come to Holmes's attention. Yes, yeah, and just to kick that off, the interesting thing, a couple of interesting things about this, just at a very high level. One is that this may be the only 
specific case of a real life scoundrel and murderer. The, the only specific reference that Holmes ever makes to someone who was a notorious criminal and murderer who was had a reputation, was the subject object of a manhunt whose execution made front page news. So there may be there may be others. You know, Holmes frequently refers to people who do this nefarious thing or that nefarious thing. But there really was a Charlie Peace. But the second interesting thing is Oh, go ahead. There there was I'm 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 I think this is from the Speckled Band. I think he mentioned Palmer and Pritchard. Oh right. Um also right. uh the, notorious the murderers. Um but but that's it. You know, that that's the only other one that comes to mind. Oh, that is interesting. I should go back and look at that. Maybe we'll do a show on Palmer and Pritchard. Oh, good idea. Yeah, real life, real life criminal. Well, this yeah, next next month we could do you know Charlie Peace Two, which is on Palmer and Pritchard. Let's have another better. piece, another piece on Peace. <laughs> but the interesting thing is the dates, the dates. Now you know chronology drives people crazy, and there are a lot of people who don't want to pay any attention to the chronology of the Sherlock Holmes cases. But we know or at least that most chronologists generally agree that Holmes's early cases before Watson brought study in Scarlet to us were the Gloria Scott, which is generally dated around 1874, and the Musgrave Ritual, which is generally dated around 1879. And so that makes it completely possible for Holmes to have been involved in the cases, uh, case involving Charlie Peace because... Uh, Peace was somebody who was born in 1832, and it's you know you can look online and read a lot about Charlie Peace. Apparently, he was working in a steel mill, had a serious injury to his leg. He was a short person for a man of small small stature, as it's reported, about five foot three or five foot four, and it's reported that he uh, had a period where he was collecting and selling musical instruments. And that he played the violin well enough to perform at local concerts as well as public houses. Well, that doesn't make him a violin virtuoso. <laughs> but in any case, um, his murder, his first murder, is apparently committed in November of 1876, after which he went on the run. And he was uh, eventually arrested uh, in 1870. Eight and so on, and um, then there were another crime. Uh, well, I'm not really clear on that, but the point is that that um, this fits piece right in around the Musgrave ritual. Let's say uh, in 1879, as opposed to study in Scarlet, which took place in 1881. Hmm. Yeah, that would have been um, a little early on for Holmes to be involved professionally in any manner. Um, it certainly would have been the case that, as this was a high-profile uh, case, a high-profile murder and, and um, criminal court case, that Holmes would have been tracking it as part of his self-education. Uh, that this, this is, um, I don't know if it rises to the, uh, the crime of the century type thing. Um, but if it was celebrated in the newspapers and if there was a well-known manhunt going on, uh, then, of course, it would have attracted the attention of a young Sherlock Holmes who was trying to make his way in the field of detection. Well, we'll have a little bit more about this after we come back from this short word. You know, it's all well and good to have a subscription to the Baker Street Journal. In fact, the most recent issue just recently came out and is making its way to mailboxes all over the world. But when you're looking for scholarship past rather than present, the easiest way to go about finding that is with the EBSJ. The EBSJ is a PDF archive that provides a complete set of the Baker Street Journal from its inception in 1946 all the way through 2011 on a single DVD in PDF format. 
That's 276 issues with more than 18,000 pages spanning the old series, the Christmas annuals, and the new series all the way through 2011. Will there be another EBSJ to update us in the last decade? Well, we certainly hope so. What format will it take? Well, that's up to you to find out. But get the EBSJ version 2 on DVD while it's still around. Find it online at BakerStreetIrregulars.com. Well, Bert, I realized that I didn't make good on my promise there. Those were many short words. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about Charlie Peace, of course, and uh, the whole situation that Holmes found himself in um, and mentioning Charlie Peace. Now, the, here's the thing. When when Charlie Peace was young, you mentioned that he uh, was maimed in an industrial accident. And it's not clear from any of the sources that I can find as to what his injury actually was. Um there's some reference that it may have been his leg. There's another reference that it may have been his hand. Um, now, for a burglar to have a crippled hand, a maimed hand, um, that would have made his exploits even more impressive, uh, either on the stage or uh, in the back alleys as he was burgling. Actually, they weren't back alleys. They were fine houses. But he was referred to in his in his early days as um, the modern Paganini uh, because he appeared as a young man on the stage playing a violin with one string. Really? Yeah. Have you ever seen or heard anyone performing a violin with one string? Well, I would argue that his hands were probably un unmarred because the challenge there, obviously, is that you've got to depress the string right across the whole length of the of the violin to uh, create the series of notes that would normally be created by all the strings well that actually might make the case for his hand being injured because it's much easier to man manipulate one string with a stump or whatever it is that you've got on your main maybe his his fingers were fused together maybe he was missing some fingers i don't know um, but that would have been inordinately easier to manipulate than a violin with four strings or mm. five strings. How many strings? Of, it's four strings, right? Mm. A violin. Yeah. I don't. I'm I'm an accordionist by training, so I don't know how many <laughs> strings are on a violin. I don't even Just know how many. Know. I don't know how many keys there are on, a, on an accordion either, because I'm busy looking down the street as I'm running away from people chasing me. <laughs> Stop playing. But it's interesting. You know, there are a couple of different reviews of Peace's career. The, one of the, the shortest one is that he embarked on a life of crime after being maimed in this industrial accident. He killed a policeman in Manchester. He fled to Sheffield, where he became obsessed with his neighbor's wife, eventually shooting her husband dead. He settled in London, carried out a lot of burglaries, wounded the policeman who arrested him. And apparently, for some of this time, since this is the age before fingerprints, he, he identified himself as John Ward and was was put in, in jail for this. And it was eventually realized that this wasn't John Ward at all. This was Charlie Peace. And so he was then linked to that, that murder, and tried in Leeds, and then found guilty and eventually hanged. Hmm. But uh, quite a career old Charlie Peace had. But it, but it you know, it suggests that if Holmes was involved in the case at any time, it was probably around the multiple burglaries he was carrying out in Blackheath, since his involvement in the murders seems to have been, you know, generally unquestioned. Yeah. Yeah. And he, you know, it's interesting, in, in any images you find of Charlie Peace, uh, he seems to have this um, kind of a high dome of a forehead and a, a bottom jaw that juts out, making him look almost um, Neanderthal-like. And interestingly, those were actually caricatures that were made of peace at the time um, oh. because his crimes were uh, seen to be so brutal. Uh, he was given a brutal appearance 
in his caricature. Um, so, you know, will, will the real Charlie Peace please stand up? Um, I think there's a, there's a, an image of him. Actually, you know what? It's an image of, um, Madame Tussaud's, uh, waxwork of him from the Chamber of Horrors, mm. uh, where he seems a little more normal, I guess, uh, rather than that caricature that we've seen. The interesting thing about a piece is when you begin to look at his career, he really was, according to some of these descriptions of his actions, really a nasty character. I mean, what it says here is first murder. He was um, seen entering the grounds of a house. So he's burglaring around midnight. And there is a police constable, uh, Cock, who intercepts him and... Peace warns him to stand back, takes out a revolver, shoots wide, but but Cock keeps approaching. And so um, Peace fires again, seriously wounding him, and he dies eventually. And in the dark, though, Peace escapes, and two brothers living nearby are arrested and charged with the killing. And at the trial, one of them was acquitted for lack of evidence, but the second was sentenced to death, which was eventually commuted to penal servitude. But Peace apparently made a point of attending the trial just to confirm that he wasn't a suspect. <laughs> and then he goes on and becomes obsessed with this fellow, another fellow's wife. And, um, and the husband attacked him. Yeah. And it was then that he killed the husband. Yeah. And, and of course, um, they, uh, um, they tried him. It was a very quick um, sentencing, or, or, or at least a very uh, quick return of a guilty verdict just after 10 minutes. And um, Peace resigned himself to uh, his fate, and, and having nothing to lose, he made a full confession to the murder of Constable Cook in order to um, exonerate uh, William uh, Hebron, uh, th that's the man uh, whose trial he, he attended, just to see what was going on. And then he reasserted that Mrs. Dyson, that, that is this, uh, this mistress, um, that she in fact was his mistress, but she strenuously denied it, calling him a demon, quote, beyond the power of even a Shakespeare, uh, excuse me, a demon beyond the power of even a Shakespeare to paint. <laughs> Well, the interesting thing about this, too, is that apparently Peace, who's married um, in July of 1876, um, approaches Mrs. Dyson. And what happens is that Dyson, Mrs. Dyson and her husband move. You know, they get out of the neighborhood and they go to a different suburb. And in, so now it's November. Now it's the end of November. So apparently this first episode happens in July. Now it's the end of November. Uh, and up pops Peace again, who says, you see, I'm here to annoy you, and I'll annoy you wherever you go. <laughs> and then Dyson gets killed. And so what, is, what does Charlie do? Well, Charlie gets on the train, goes to Hull, where his wife keeps an eating house. So, of course, that's sort of the natural thing to do. I might as well, look, I might as well go home now. Well, uh, between all of this... You know, his, his final execution, um, his confession, uh, the, uh, the, the, the things he found himself involved in over uh, the course of many years. And, you know, when, when Peace died, he was only 46 years old. He was still a relatively young man. He, he carved quite a path for himself. So it is undeniable that Sherlock Holmes would have paid attention to his career. Now, calling him his friend... <laughs> Uh, obviously more uh, loosely fitting in the description of that. Uh, maybe maybe Holmes considered him a friend in terms of educating him about the mind of criminals. However we slice it, it is indeed a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. 
You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. From the point of view of the criminal expert, London has become a singularly uninteresting city. Well, I hardly think you'll find many decent citizens to agree with you.